Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Welcome again, folks. As you know, we've got many, many issues, worldwide, local. I mean, we've got issues, folks. And in all due respect, as, I, as you note, I've, uh, I've said that I'm going to be focusing on Oregon's issues, more specifically in the Portland metropolitan area. Very, very important. Um, but before I begin, as you know, I, I am, in fact, the outreach chair for the Republican Party for Veterans. And I'm definitely trying to promote and lobbying them to get out and, and get their benefits. Uh, and right up front, their, their, their benefits there. Many veterans are sort of afraid to not talk about their issues and whatever. And it's very, very important. So I would say to you folks who are family members of veterans who are, especially from Vietnam era war and some of the older ones, but now it's the Vietnam era veterans aspect, they need to go in. Many of them are PTSD, post-traumatic stress, actually it's mental illness. That's really what it is. I mean, we, we use the word, but the bottom line is that it's, it's really a stressful condition. That, wasn't, that condition was not recognized when I was in the service. But then after, after the Iraqi war and things of that nature, they came out with PTSD. The fact of my point is that, you know, hey, get your veterans, uh, get the veterans, get out there and get, get your benefits. They're there for you, okay? Now, with that, here's our show for today, folks. <coughs> this is an issue that, um, that, that's out there, and, and, and a lot of times folks don't understand it. There are misconceptions about it. It goes round and around and this and that and whatever. And I'm talking about Black Lives Matter. What we're going to do within this, within this hour is that we're going to educate you and inform you about what it is. And we're going to have a discussion. And I've got two, two leading proponents here locally, folks homegrown, if you will. They're going to talk about issues. And right up front, we're talking about issues. But the fact of me is that there's this connotation of Black Lives Matter that tends not, that folks tend not to want to deal with the issue. And they use that as a kind of a way of being able to stop them going any beyond that particular point about solutions mm -hmm. to issues that's back there. So I've got I've got two people, uh, very respectful people. One of which uh, you've you've identified the the, uh, the name the the, the 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 brand, if you will, of Black Lives Matter, and Teresa Redford. Mm -hmm. And Teresa's right here with us, and she's on my on my left, uh, as far as you looking on the screen. And I've got a gentleman by the name of Royal uh, Royal Royal yes, Harris. Sir. And uh, again, two young people, <laughs> and uh, that. That, that is our future, <laughs> that is our future aspect of it. And I think they've got enough background to really talk about this particular issue, and so it's very, very important. So we're going to do it. But we're going to be begin initially with, uh, with Teresa. I want you to know that I, I happen to know that she's, she's locally, she's, she's a local-born person. She's got a lot of folks here. I happen to know her folks here to also, too. Uh, and um, I also got involved with her in, in a number of issues, mm -hmm. one, of, one of which was um, <laughs> uh, she ran for um, uh, Multnomah County Commissioner, right? You don't remember. And, yeah, I rem she said that she's trying to remind me that, and, but I, I happen <laughs> to have been there also too, but, but we can, that's another show we can mm -hmm. talk about. But the fact of the matter is she's very, very much involved. <laughs> I mean, she's out there, and, um, and, and, I, and she, she'll go into her, her background and this, that, and the other. But my primary purpose is I want you to know she's a very credible person. Uh, within the community here in the state of Oregon, activism is, is kind of a, a no-pay type job aspect. Every it. yeah. it's not a glamorous kind of a situation. It's, it's like running for office. It's never a glamorous situation aspect of it. But the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, we're not talking about terrorism. We're not talking about this, this, that, and the other. And that's another reason why I'm, I'm wanting to do a particular show because uh, the, the the latest issue was the the issue with the Attorney General's office and the whole issue of the investigation, and then the FBI getting in this thing and whatever. And, and we've got all kinds. Everybody sort of in a, in a kind of a not knowing what to do and, 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 and all of a sudden naming people and, and this and the other. And I wanted to make sure that um, that was not the case here with, um, with Teresa and I think we need to spend some time and I think at the end of the show you'll understand where I'm coming from. Yeah. Okay, fine. Teresa, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Good. Thank I know you for you, having me I on. I know you got your bullhorn. You. Mm -hmm. I know you're out there working as it is. Yeah, well, we're on Martin Luther King. You don't know what might happen. I, I know, I know. I want well, to look, be prepared. <laughs> well, you know, I tell you what, for the benefit of, and I, like I said, I've got, um, I got Royal here. He can input and everybody, you can open up anytime you want to. But what we want to do is that we want to give you the opportunity to kind of give us a little update. Kind of like, uh, and maybe an update on on some of the activities that you've been in, maybe some of the future activities aspect of it, and then and then from your own word, what is your definition of Black Lives Matter and how did all? Because that's basically what the brand that people are always kind of like. Well, what is it and mm -hmm. why are you why are you involved, et cetera, et cetera. Why don't you just start off. Just right on. Well, um, I was going to say I haven't been on in a while, but yes. since the last time I was on, 
uh, we had some protests that happened around the country, and I've been a lead organizer for the ones here in Oregon. And so um, instead of running for office this year, I've been running in the streets and pushing uh, civil disobedience to kind of break through bureaucracy in order to get some things done. And this past legislative se session mm -hmm. was pretty much, you know, but do that, but like I said, labor. But before we really get in discussion, mm -hmm. try, in your own word, how, do, how would you define Black Lives <clears throat> Matter and how did it come about? Well, to Let's me, it's, it's basically, it's a cry for humanity. Okay. You know, you're basically saying that in our country and in our society and in our time, that uh, what, what we would sense in, the, in regards to the value of black lives, that there is none or it's minimal. And so when we say black lives matter, it's not to say that other lives don't matter or that our lives matter more. And I'm tired of saying it because I'm, I'm sure a lot of people know it, but we're just saying that we matter too. And really we're saying that we know that we don't matter. And that's why I said it's a cry for humanity because we want people to know that we're ready to stand up and do whatever it takes to, to show that value. Um, and to be accountable on our own end, so. Okay, now the Don't Shoot Portland, that was another brand that was out there. What does, <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, it was uh, started in response to the Mike Brown murder that happened in August of uh, August 9th of 2014. Um, community members here called me during the night and during the day after he was murdered and asked me, was there something we could do? Because they remembered that I had done a rally for Trayvon Martin when mm -hmm. he was murdered. And so they were like, you know, Tressa, what are we going to do? And I was like, well, what do you want to do? And they were like, well, we want to protest. And in my mind, you know, um, I wasn't really interested in doing a protest. You know, I was like, well, that's not going to help. You know, you got to go out there and you got to start legislating. I'm thinking the politics. And uh, people were like, well, we want to do something right now. And so I connected with some people through Amnesty International and some students from Portland State University and ended up going to a big protest that was happening downtown at Pioneer Square. And we had also organized one over on MLK. But it just happened that the same night, the people from Michelle Obama's, uh, you know, the whole gun legislation, every town, they were in town and they wanted me to meet with them regarding some upcoming gun legislation. So I went to one of the protests and I didn't go to the other. And the other was in my community. And when I saw the outcome of what had happened, uh, because we didn't have, like, it was a quick response around the world. People reacted to this and people organized within their community. But what I saw here in my own community was that we weren't able to organize that quickly. So I figured, okay, well, we're going to have a meeting on community action planning. Mm -hmm. And we're going to figure out how, as a community, we can organize. And so we did that again in August on the 14th and at Dawson Park. And we came up with Don't Shoot Portland. Um, and the thing is, is that the chance started with Mike Brown, don't shoot Portland, hands up, don't shoot. Then it went into I can't breathe. And then it went into, you know, Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And so by October mm -hmm. and November, we were screaming Black Lives Matter all the way until now. And so um, a lot has changed within the protest movement um, since then. And you know that in every city and every town, it's a different reason for a yeah. different movement. We're mm -hmm. not all just protesting the death of people that live 2,000 miles away from us. We're protesting the systems within our communities that allow that to happen where we live. Mm -hmm. And more specifically, here in Portland. Oh, absolutely. In Portland aspect of it, okay. And then what about some of the activities, there? you know, some of the, some of the past activities that you were involved in? and organizing, if you will, with folks. Oh, well, I mean, well, we've done, I, I'm, I'm sure, dozens upon dozens of protests because it was passion, and the names wouldn't stop coming. We had this tagline that was called Carry the Names, so every mm -hmm. time somebody would die, like today, is the anniversary of Tamir Rice being killed. He was a 12-year-old boy from Ohio, and so, you know, in the middle of saying Mike Brown and trying to hold it down for him, you you keep getting these names mm -hmm. because the way things are now, what's different with the old civil rights movement is the communication comes a lot faster mm -hmm. and it's a lot more accessible. So once you start organizing and protesting and you have social media as an asset to communicate, um, you're able to connect with everybody else's mm -hmm. cause and support their movements. So like when Freddie Gray was killed in Baltimore, Everybody on the ground across the nation knew that if we didn't protest and support what was happening in Baltimore, then they could be shut down. Their voices would be shut out. So we had to show that, look, they got national support, so you guys better listen. Mm -hmm. And then we have the same expectation when we're at home. But here we have to get a little bit more organized on supporting locally because people, even the families, aren't willing to do anything about the things that happen mm -hmm. to their children. Um, and it's because, you know, we live in a, a peculiar space here in Oregon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for black people. It's not like, you know, Ferguson, where 70% mm -hmm. of the population is black. We're in a place where we're less than 10%, you know? You know, I noticed also, too, <clears throat> that um, 
you know, not as I say, you said Black Lives Matter, that it was just only black folks, but I, I noticed that the majority, and many way, and many majority of participants here in some of the marches and some of the events that you've been are white. Well, white people know a lot more about racism than black people do, unless okay. it's been perpetrated upon us because they live in it, they grow up in it, and so when they seen us out there, a lot of the ones that have empathy for the community and, and their future and their children's future were like, if we don't get out there, somebody's going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. And if we don't support them, they're going to be shut down. But that message is necessary. So they come out there as a support system. When the white people show up at the protest, they're like, what can we do? And their main purpose is to make sure that nobody brings harm to us, mm -hmm. um, even if they have to scare their own people. And, I, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of uh, support, like from Veterans for Peace, Jobs with Justice, um, different unions that are out here. You I know. saw Jamie was one of Oh, Jamie Partridge, everybody. And uh, what I've learned over the last year is that a lot of the things that they're all dealing with, environmental issues, everything, is relative to the same stuff that we're dealing with. So in having their support on the front line, we build political support uh, on the inside, mm -hmm. which is going to benefit us this year because, you know, we got to come off the street at some point, And right now we're going to the campuses. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we, we're steady in um, positions at Portland State University. We're building a really super relationship with the students at Lewis and Clark. And those are our law students, our future judges and district attorneys. So we want to support them as much as possible. Um, we have students from Reynolds that are, you know, building BSUs along with, and I'm telling them, partner with the students at the, at the law school's BSUs mm -hmm. so that you can get that mentorship and not go into nursing, but go into politics or, or government because that's where we need them. Um, there's not enough representation, and especially not here. Mm -hmm. But I think we can get it homegrown. Mm -hmm. You know, Roy, you want you want to you want to get in on this one. What's, what, what do you feel so far about the definition of, of uh, Black Lives Matter, and what does it mean? I think, to follow what you said, a lot of it is, I think there's a local component that speaks to every situation where people are. Because my, actually my daughter, my oldest daughter, she was one of the original and lead uh, student organizers in Ferguson and St. Louis. And so from her, I get the perspective of what it's like there. Okay. And mm -hmm. some of the things that they face, like she said, they, are, they make up 70% of Ferguson, but literally Ferguson is like going from Broadway to Fremont. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and in St. Louis, there are a lot of little municipalities that cover maybe a neighborhood. The Elliott community might be a town where the King community might be a town. So even though you have these pockets of people of color, the influence isn't there. The, the decision making skills or tools aren't there for them. So they create unique perspectives for those for those different regions. Those communities. But mm -hmm. if you look overarchingly across the country, it's still economics, it's still opportunity, mm -hmm. it's still quality of life, it's still education, it's still safety. Mm -hmm. And I think the other part that's just as important, and I look and I always look back to what Malcolm X said, until as African Americans we just understand the primary part to who we are is African and make it a human rights issue versus mm -hmm. a civil right. Civil just deals with the munici municipality and how it governs it. Mm -hmm which is why, to a certain degree, election cycles affect things. Mm -hmm. And as long as we ask for civil rights, when we're, and like she said, we're talking about humanity, yeah. mm -hmm. we're kind of missing it. And also what that means is Black Lives Matter as a global construct. Mm -hmm. I think too often what we do, we try to too often localize what's going on with ourselves without creating those pathways for the African diaspora to all engage in this. As a, as, as a global community, of over a billion people, mm -hmm. that's really powerful. Even in Oregon, when you connect, if you think about Portland, when we say Black Lives Matter, one in five young people is of African descent, not African American, pure African. Mm -hmm. So the dynamic. What of do you what mean by that? So, for example, in Portland, the African, the Black community, and right. I don't really say African, right. the Black community, mm -hmm. as far as young people, is 20% Somali. That doesn't include. Uh, people from Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Nigeria, Sierra Leone. It doesn't include them, but if just that, that's that. One in five is Somali. So what? So when we say Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. it's not a construct of I was born in the United States. When we talk about Martin Luther King, it it it, it stretches across a diaspora, yeah. because just like I hate to say it, just as much as we suffer racism, Black people in France are suffering it. Black people in Germany are suffering it. Black people in Africa are still suffering it as the residuals of colonialism. Mm -hmm. yes. And what we're seeing is res our resources matter. 
our talents as far as entertainers or money providers or producers for someone else matters, but our humanity on a global scale isn't seen as one continuum that matters. And that's what it means. We have to accept the fact that whatever a black kid in Oregon is just as valuable as a black kid in Germany or as a black kid in Africa. Until we bring that one billion people of consciousness together, we, we, we suffer from these things. Why is it so hard to sell? I'll, I'll give both of you. Well, why is it? What do you think, T? Why is well, it so hard to what sell? I'm, what I'm learning, because a lot of the people that I support in these protests, like I call myself a first responder. I get calls from students, from families, from people in our community that are like, Tressa, we need help with this to the point where I'm I'm so tired to where I don't help them. I help them help themselves so that they can provide more help for more people. But I think that our, our lack of unity is because of that. We have lack of support systems for one another. And I look at that as an issue with our government system because they become the go-to thing for everything. They're like, you go to the government for everything. You go to the county for everything. You go to the city for everything. And I'm like, what happened to the people that provided the services in the community that you didn't have to deal with the county in order to go and do business with? You know, like... There are supposed to be professional providers within every community. If I live in Lake Oswego or Hillsboro, the same programs and services that I need for my family to be productive in society, the same resources and opportunities are there for all of us. But in Multnomah County, if you're a person of color, they have segregated systems to provide resources to you. And you have to go through segregated organizations and community partners in order to take advantage of those systems. And because everything is obligated to maintain support systems for the government, um, there's a deficiency on distribution of resources. It's like you got to do too much to be in a position to help other people and you never get to the help other people part. And I'm like, well, break down all those systems and put it back into our community so we can help each other. You know, if you had grassroots organizations, you know, led by people like this, he knows how to do any job he can be hired to do. But he needs to be given the capacity to build an industry. Mm -hmm. And he has the capacity to run and manage an industry, mm -hmm. but he doesn't have the resources or the opportunity. You well, know, and people legitimately, intentionally develop that in their communities. Mm -hmm. That's called business and community mm -hmm. empowerment and development. Mm -hmm. We do not do that here. There is a serious wall around community empowerment. Mm -hmm. well, I think in Portland, we have the same potential as anyone else. We have potential I think, and access, and I but think we're not one, getting it. I won't, and I guess here's my yeah. premise. If you're not mine, I'm not obligated to give you anything. And I'm not saying, and I don't say that to say that in white communities or European communities that they don't care. But in every ethnic group, do for self is the primary recourse first and foremost. And I think as I think as African Americans in Portland more so, because of our peculiar situation and how Oregon was constructed, in the peculiar way our demographics look, sometimes we take on that position where we haven't that self identity issue. One of the big things I always say is we can do anything on our scale. We're not that big that if we do it to scale for us, it can't happen. I think what happens for a lot of people is the validation for their work comes through the county or the city or their opportunity to really make it. Yeah. And I think one thing we don't do is we don't mobilize as a community and have these kind of discussions or ask or ask each other, how do we create these pathways for ourselves? And I mm. think that's part of what has to happen for us. I can't really say it. I'm going to be mad at Multnomah County if they don't provide a service mm -hmm. as much as saying, okay, if they don't, what do we do? For, mm -hmm. And it's funny, I had an interesting conversation with the gentleman yesterday, and one of the things he talked about, through every situation in the United States history where the country in aggregate has had a problem, black America's still been kind of cool, even during the Depression. And those years afterwards, we had Black Wall Street in North Carolina and Oklahoma for one simple reason. We weren't privy to someone else's resources, so we pulled our own. Mm -hmm. If you look at That's as much as ever, even during the civil rights movement, one thing people don't always look at is the number of black financial institutions we lost to integrate, yeah. the number of black hospitals we lost to integrate, the number of black leaders in these, in these fields we lost because they were integrated to a subservient role which changes our narrative on how we look at how we take care of ourselves. Right now, we have mechanisms to provide mental health support, physical health support within the county. What happens is we don't, as communities, say, okay, how do we work together? Maybe my shop, maybe I have a mom and pop 
doctor's office. Maybe you have a mom and pop dentist's office. Mm -hmm. If we aggregate our resources and become a one-stop shop, our economy is boomed up to scale. We can do more. And then also we inspire other people because now those basic needs are being met by somebody who looks like them. Mm -hmm. Part of the thing that Black Lives Matter, it, it isn't as much just don't kill me or don't shoot mm -hmm. me. The matter has to come internally with us first to say black lives matter and we create industry, we create opportunity, we create pathway. And I'm a big believer. If we can't take care of ourselves in, in a self-sufficient manner, how can we say our lives matter if we don't promote life in ourselves? Well, let me throw this on the table with you <clears throat> and, and thinking, it's sort of like bringing, my, my going back, I can remember when I was sitting in your seat and you know the same issues were being addressed, trying to adjust, and the reaction from the majority community was okay fine let's then uh, try to identify leadership uh, within the black community in the portland metropolitan area and as a result of that i can remember when i was at the portland observer newspaper and i owned the portland observer newspaper mm -hmm. and the effort was made in fact ron herndon was sitting at the table too we were both there there and the idea is that we couldn't get anyone elected from our area and so we went basically and got uh, redefined the boundaries mm -hmm. to effectively yes, get do. someone and you now at the end of the day uh, Margaret Carter came into play, mm -hmm. and she became the leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was something that they were saying. Okay, fine. Now that you have that aspect of it, and after some of the politicians didn't like the idea of doing it that way, but the, but all of a sudden there's there's this leadership, and the same thing exists with Loretta, having the same boat to a certain degree. Uh, you start thinking about. Um, uh, how she got elected and who supported her, that kind of a deal, mm -hmm. and, and the process, but, my, but the, that, that was supposed to have been there. And so we got this leadership aspect of it. We got, uh, we got the Tony Hobson School, if you will. That was another thing, thinking about that. We had the public school, the largest mm -hmm. public school in the state of Oregon, uh, which doesn't have voc ed at all. You know, mm -hmm. and but yet and still, yeah, it's the largest school in our. And so then you 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 put that all <clears> in place, and you put these so-called black leaders in the, in these in these in these positions, and they were saying, "Well, gee whiz, well, we've done our part. Now, are they representing the black community?" Hmm. But I guess Black my, Lives Matter. But I guess know? my thing is, no white person who's going to tell me who my black leader is, or pol whether you're political, media, all that. And mm -hmm. I think. To a certain degree, that's been one of the okay. deficits in Portland. We don't claim it ourselves. It's not as much we don't you claim don't it. Our leadership tell you that you're a leader. Your is, community doesn't come through happen. us. And when it does, there's a certain point for it to actually stick in Portland. Mm -hmm. There has to be that larger validation, not based on a collaborative respect as much mm -hmm. as, okay, now you've reached here. Do you want to play by our rules? Mm -hmm. And I think to a certain degree, and I don't knock anyone because... Portland has made great strides yeah. in the last 25 years, but one of the things I always talk about is in those strides, were you making, were, was that generation making them for themselves, mm -hmm. or were they making it to align certain things for the next generation to have the autonomy to provide a healthy lifestyle for the black community? Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. to a certain degree, we've we've continued that pathological sense of being hold, being beholden to people who look at our deficits versus being able to articulate our strengths ourselves and build on that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to be taking, about, uh, taking a little break in about another four minutes, but in all due respect, I apologize for not giving you the opportunity to let the people know what you do. Okay. okay. Go on. Why don't you share that before, before we take this break? Well, okay, let's see. So right now, I work for I work with Michael Braxton and Rachel Meyer at the Empowerment Clinic, and we work and provide holi holistic mental health services for people of color, people not of color, those in the, in the Portland metropolitan area. I'm working with the aerospace science and kids at uh, I know I didn't say that right, but at PCC where Michael Grice was and did an yeah, yeah. incredible job providing that foundation. Uh, and what do they do there? Uh, well, one what of are you doing are, there? It, it, the biggest thing is to promote science to young kids of color okay and open those doors and open those pathways and the ideas for careers and those type of things whether mm -hmm. it's in the aerospace industry whether it's in technology whether it's in science but giving our kids some of those opportunities that just aren't naturally available to them or even if you're not a kid of color for whether it's due to economics providing those pathways for kids to have the opportunity to expand their mind their abilities the idea of what they can do with life. So, I'll, so that's that. Uh, work at Grant. I do a, a young men's group at Grant High School. Uh, I do a. I work with a guy, Ray, Nate Roberts, with a uh, Pro, Pro, Multnomah County Parole and Probation. We do an African American men's group at the Columbia River Correctional Institution, and 
every third Saturday of the month at Hughes Memorial Methodist Church, 111 Northeast Failing. Mm -hmm. We do a, a African American men's group called Black Men United. We just had our group yesterday. I was telling you about it. I want to thank their, their incredible people, uh, Robin Franklin, her mm -hmm. mom, Eric Payton, great the, the incredible <laughs> legend jw friday mm -hmm. for yeah, giving yes, this yes. for okay. giving this vehicle and i think we've been doing this since the state of oregon report came out through mm -hmm. the urban league last year we've had over 50 men participate nice. and so we've gone from idea to now we're actually implementing ideas and creating action steps and moving forward with the whole idea of bringing in black men together for fellowship for leadership and to actually to create that self-determination i think one of the great things we've done with it is up until this most recent meeting we had yesterday, every meeting has included a father who either brought a child, which was a daughter, or a son, or even a grandchild. Because what we really want to promote is that sense of fellowship yeah. and self-determination. Mm -hmm. So how are we promoting this? I mean, I mean I, don't get me wrong, I, we're here on the Oregon Voters Digest. That's one of the reasons why I wanted mm -hmm. to bring you all on, because Black Lives Do Matter. That's the brand that you mm -hmm. carry. Fair? Mm -hmm. They're right? Fair? So why aren't, we not, why aren't we not getting that to the majority committee? I mean, they, are, they are part of the yeah. participation because in some cases they are funding it, right? Mm -hmm. They are funding it, right? Well, not in my world. I mean, no, but in I'm your particular world, they're, yeah. they're, 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 get, they're with you, they're, they're on the front line with well, you. Well, the thing is, is the that why, um, why unless you control your own media, one of the things, when my nephew was killed when I first came back home, mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't understand why everybody wasn't communicating, so I built a group page called 40 Days Seeking Common Unity on Facebook, and I invited everybody that was going to gang task force meetings, everybody that was on every listserv that I could find, and then I set up another page called I Lost a Loved One to Gang Violence, and then I just kept on setting up all these random group pages so that we could have places to congregate, because I figured, wow, everybody's on Facebook talking, but they don't communicate in real life, so we need to start talking about things that are going to help us become conscious about mm -hmm. what's happening in our community so we can start moving forward. And I've seen a lot of movement um, over the last five years. I've seen a lot of systemic movement. I've seen a lot of our community movement. I don't get to move within my community a lot because of the peculiarness of our community and our state. I mean, we're still under state-sanctioned discrimination, so I'm not going to be naive to the fact that my methodology is going to, you know, sometimes be um, offensive or, or unsafe in a political way, not violence or anything like that for people that I love. So I like to maintain, I'm an introvert anyway, I like to maintain a pen and a pencil mm -hmm. and a space where I can build and do things that are necessary and just, you know, let everybody maintain where they are and just hope that it works in a cohesive manner at the point where it's necessary. But um, I think unless we start controlling our own media and then at the same time, if we are working for organizations that are contracting us, demand in our obligation to provide the services that they provide marketing and outreach services as well that include the materials for distribution and any media support that's necessary, any advanced workshops that can create more engagement opportunities um, to promote the services that are happening. Because a lot of times, even me being online, I got too many people in my network now to even know what's happening in the community unless they come to me directly. But I don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. I got to go to those group pages to see what's happening because I'm out in the streets, but I don't see it. I'll see posters two weeks after something's, you know, finished happening and it'll look brand new. And I've had people that I've connected with that I've given flyers to and I'll see the same flyers sitting on the table. So we just have to be more thoughtful and intentional about sharing information that's necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, as I, we're going to be taking a short break right now, but you know, you got quite a bucket list, you know that. Much. Oh yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it's, it's pretty full, and, and even yourself too, Royal. I, I think <clears> about that also too. When we come back, let's uh, let's give them another another educational piece, if you will. <laughs> and if, what's the definition of of black gangs? I mean. Oh yeah, we can gangs. go there. Because when the moment you start talking about gangs, mm. automatically it's just it's black. And I've said this about this on there, yeah. and we need to talk about that. We need to educate folks about that. We're going to take a short break, folks, and we'll be right back. Okay. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Welcome back, folks. The Oregon Voters Digest. Bruce Broussard, your host. Our show today is Black Lives Matter. And we're giving Oregonians an opportunity to understand what it's all about. And I've got two brilliant guests with good background and good input. And in, in, uh, Teresa Rayford, you've, probably, you've seen her before. And we've got uh, Royal Harris. Yes, and it's been, a, it's been quite, a, quite an insight, even on my part. Again, like I said, I could be—I I was sitting in your same seat about 20 years ago. <laughs> but maybe we might put a dent in this at this point in time. That's you know what right. I'm saying? And and I, and I like the idea because the fact of that is, you know, our young people today are a little different than the, even when I was coming up. Uh, I was very active during those those particular times, but the fact of that is, no leadership. Mm. I mean, people were sort of run off from me, and I was just out there by myself, running for office on a number of occasions, but I stayed there. Mm -hmm. You had a and, whole lot of people behind you, Bruce. Yeah, but the bottom line is just like yourself. You guys had those pastors right there on the front line with you back then. Yeah, but you too. You're in the same mm -hmm. boat. I mean, the whole nine yards, Royal is the same boat. The fact of that is, we got to start acting. You know, the, the folks out there who are basically, i.e., from a media standpoint, mm -hmm. is going to have to do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking about the current media today so that we can get back in the we got issues and we got to solve these issues our young people are our future mm -hmm. you are our future you're the next leadership aspect of it and then and after that after you there's some other young folks aspect of it mm -hmm. our education system is very poor in this particular city at this point in time Portland Public School is the largest school district in the, in the state of Oregon and it has some of the major failures if you will and when I when I oh. hear you about talking about the well, we were talking a bit, a bit about uh, voc ed and things of that mm -hmm. nature aspect of it we got the largest school district and you got school districts outside of the city of Portland that have voc ed and voc ed is very very important mm -hmm. when you start talking about reading writing and arithmetic a lot of the folks don't have the background if you will to be enthusiastic if you will and my, my point is that if you've got that voc ed aspect of it now I got the enthusiasm you mm -hmm. know what I mean I want to know and you've got to be well read I think Going on. that's twofold in my opinion one it really has to do with what we value as a community. And, and I say that because I have a daughter who went to school, went to Central Chicago, did quite well, but it was the expectation of her. And I think for too many of our young people, I think we've allowed the pessimistic nature of our culture in general to make us apathetic as adults about our expectations of our young people. Okay. I remember when I was younger, when I was, I was one of, and when Harriet Tubman was still new middle school, I think one of the things, even as a sixth grade, we were un we understood the the baseline essays, which mm -hmm. are still sitting mm -hmm. on the shelves in Portland Public School, and what that meant for us, for first and foremost, for knowledge of self, but to bring value and meaning to school. I worked in I worked at a pre apprenticeship program for two years, and working with the trades, one of the things I found, when, especially working with kids in the summer, is you find education has to be relevant to where I'm going next, and I think mm -hmm. for so long. Our kids haven't had that connection mm -hmm. to see how education tangibly relates to life. And until we start to look at that, and also as adults, looking at, do we promote education? Are we continuous learners as parents? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because how could you, and I guess it becomes stewardship. How are we stewarding our lives? How are we stewarding our kids' lives? And just as importantly, how are, and it goes back again to leadership, how are we creating succession plans and pathways for not only for our kids to excel, but to get those opportunities to put it in action. You know, one of the things I always shout out my partner Rob, Rob Ingram. We used to hey, always Rob. talk about the biggest problem in Portland that we've had for a long time, especially with black leadership, is mm -hmm. folks don't want to stop being a leader until they drop dead. Uh, so you have generations. Mm -hmm. So you have generations who are waiting for the baton, baton who who are current, who are knowledgeable, and who are looking at the changes coming. But they're hindered by this person in front who doesn't want to let go, mm. and they're hindered by people behind who are pushing on them. And, the, and, and in a general sense of apathy, we don't look at the prize. We, get, uh, we don't look, okay, I'm a real big believer. I could care less with any other economic, cultural, or political groups school graduation rates are other than African Americans. Not because I don't want them to be successful, but I know they're going to be and there are mechanisms in place. So I should worry about mine. If the graduation rate for Portland Public Schools is abysmally 47%, mm -hmm. my bigger concern is what's the African American graduation rate? How do we use, how do we utilize churches as Saturday academies mm -hmm. to close that gap in math and mm -hmm. science? Mm -hmm. How are we pulling back in? How are we using the trades? Why isn't it happening? Because I think twofold. For me, it's twofold. One, huh? 
I ain't gonna know what to talk it's about. It's access. Of, <laughs> I think one of the big poverties we experience that we don't really talk about is not a poverty of finance. It's a poverty of information. Unless you're in the right room to hear the right people speak or in the right circles, life exchanging information doesn't get shared. Working in the trades, for example, they always talk about the good old boy network. Well, the good old boy work network used to work for my grandfather and his friends. That's mm -hmm. how they got here from Arkansas. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell somebody I know about a job. I'm going to bring him in. And just as importantly, I'm going to tell him what will be expected for success. We have a general, we're in our second generation of kids who think showing up is a reward that you get paid for. Excellence is the reward you get paid for. Mm -hmm. And until we start to make these, these kind of things at the bottom, the other is structurally... It's not set up for us. There's within the within the trades. There's been a community benefits agreement with the city of Portland for the last couple of years mm -hmm. to increase the number of African American yeah. men in the trades and African American people of color in general. But what happens is this: I can hire a black woman. I got black and female. We can cut that out. So there's a black man who's trying, but now you can't get that family wage job. So what happens is we get this sense of fatalism where oh, it's not cut out for me. But again, we don't look at entrepreneurship. We don't look at coalition building with each other. We don't look at aggregating our resources as a, as, a, as a whole community. There are pieces of the pie that do that. And for whatever reason, sometimes they don't share the information. Sometimes, and what you can say in a market economy, if you get a bunch of people who want a job, but they don't want to work, don't hire them. But Roy, I'm agreeing with you, but like I said, I, could, I was sitting in that same chair mm -hmm. at one point in time and mm -hmm. saying the same thing. How do we break it? Now, I, I, I'm going to bring Teresa in because there were some things that she was doing at Portland Public Schools. She was calling for audits and this, that, and the other. I want you to share that. Well, I, I what worked was your in, thought? Yeah. Why, did you go, why did you do that, Portland Public Schools? Well, you, you mentioned that I was a native of Oregon. And um, what ended up happening is after a couple of family members of mine were killed in violence, like, you know, informant police killing my cousin Forrest and, you know, just different relatives being killed back in the 80s and the early 90s. I decided to relocate to Texas, and I worked for a, a, an accountant, a, a black CPA, certified public accountant, for 15 years. Me and him developed companies and businesses, and, you know, we had a lot of clients. And so I learned a lot about business development and return on investments. And I learned a lot about risk-taking and not waiting and looking for information. And so um, I came back with that attitude. Some of my friends in Texas, they were asking me to run for Congress just because of some of the programs that I developed through nonprofits that we were supporting as a partner um, you know, just to help write I off our taxes. We, we needed tax deductions too, you know, yeah, and we yeah. had, took hobby opportunities so that not only could we donate to these organizations as philanthropists, but that we could also use our time to help them develop their outreach, their operational systems and everything else. So I learned a lot of things, like when I used to work on my grandma's VCR, take that mug open, look at what's happening, blow off some of the dirt and start re-putting the, the pieces in there. And so I think that that's, the thing that we have to do as a generation. We're not a generation of kids anymore. Me and Royal, we're a first generation of being adults at this time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have children that have already graduated from high school mm -hmm. and college and everything else. My children haven't been in the criminal system. Um, they run their own businesses. You know, they're taking care of their families um, and they don't live here. And they went to a school called Paul Lawrence Dunbar, mm -hmm. named after a black man, you know, in Texas. And so, um, and they were in ad advanced academics, you know, and they tried harder based on the information that they were bringing home. They would research the work that they were doing so that they could learn more about it because they didn't think that they were getting an effective education because it was so many students in the class. And I would buy them whatever they needed to advance that opportunity. And I think that because of the resources and the technology that we have available to us today, that as black people in modern America, we have to take time to be philanthropic with one another. And just like how uh, Royal spends his time in different groups with men trying to elevate the self-determination factor, uh, we have to spend time as community members and, and provide this financial support systems. And we're not always going to be able to make it to each other's events, but let's be mindful of calling people and asking them to be there. And let's be mindful of including them in leadership roles. I don't like the idea of waiting for... Um, somebody to acknowledge that we're leaders. I believe that everybody from my class, and probably I'd say maybe 
I'll give the class 84 leadership now. <laughs> but I mean, we were born as leaders. We came out the box just running into the city and together we were all, all at these different schools and we would converge together and we were able to identify as leaders in our community before we were even all the way in high school. Mm -hmm. In middle school, we knew who we were and what type of power we mm -hmm. had. And just like in Ferguson with those little cities and municipalities, we had North Portland and Northeast Portland and Southeast Portland and all that. But when we came together, we knew that we were powerful powerful and we all grew up together it didn't matter if you went to Ockley Green or Whitaker we were still probably best friends because we went to Peninsula Park mm -hmm. you know so um, we have to get that back because we have the power that we need the city doesn't have it the government nobody has a system available that can provide us what we need in our community to be empowered hmm. we have those systems right in our mind but we have to take the time to spend together and then just trust each other a little bit to just go do it mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. we I, I don't know how I've been able to maintain outside of just asking God for courage and just saying, okay, Lord, let me, okay, that's what you want me to do. And then I'll just go ahead and roll on it. Like my mom say, be safe and don't forget to pray. That's what I do. I ask for prayer. My pastor asked me, you know, what can we do for you? You pray for me because God got this. I don't know who I am. I'm learning about this new person, but I used to be the person that would wait for the client to come in and tell me something. But when I got into accounting, and that's why I'm always asking for accountability and audits. I learned how to look at what was happening and build on it and take it apart, fix it, dismantle it, whatever we need to do. But right now, the, the, even the movement, the Black Lives Matter, it's about dismantling state sanctioned discrimination. Mm -hmm. It's about dismantling those policies and that language that's perpetrating these uh, problems that we have with resource acquisition, mm -hmm. you know, to the point where we have to go into a system to receive it. Those things should be available to all of us, but I've already identified that within our government and we just had a um, you know they, they just came out with a, an assessment through public integrity that basically said we in Oregon received an F in corruption because of the way our system is so when we talk about a peculiar system we really have a dirty problem within our government system and mm -hmm. that's on whatever blue red green yellow white tea party or whatever you want to be in y'all corrupt here um, and until people like myself get into the streets or go into the city chambers or do whatever we need to do to call it out and ask for the audits, they're not going to be accountable. In fact, Don't ask them to reform something right. that's already messed up. Break it and right. tell them to take it and clear it up. And that's what I and that's what I would like for you to spend a couple minutes on in regards to you went to Portland Public Schools. And I noticed that mm -hmm. was an article. Which, share that with with us in terms of. What, what actually transpired during that particular what time? What you mean, like? That was the one that you, you'd gone to the school district oh. and was challenging some of the, the actual, the, the results, the well, end results Royal of knows, the program. When my nephew died, Royal, uh, when my nephew died he, his obituary picture was his cap and gown picture from his graduation. And since um, I came home and that happened, uh, most of the obituaries that I'm seeing are children with cap and gowns, and they're not getting a 21. And so... From an accounting standpoint, I have to look at where is the problem between their their primary years and the point and that they yeah. turn into teenagers right. and die before they become adults. What is the factor in there that can strengthen their resolve um, to keep them out of community violence, mm -hmm. whether it's suicide, because we have a large rate of suicide, um, community violence, rape, whatever it is, what can we do and how do we get a handle on it? Well, it's in primary education. It's in that time when whatever is happening within that household, when they go into that school system, there's opportunities to advance their mindset. Like when we talk about STEM or when we talk about vocational training, there's an opportunity to put your hands on something and have the power of developing mm -hmm, or the mm -hmm. power of understanding. And if you don't have that, let's say that our curriculum is not, or our, our cultural or equity is not curriculum based, then that's a loss of opportunity mm -hmm. for our children. Mm -hmm. You know, that has nothing to do with the, the school system. That means that because we have an issue with our curriculum, that our equity needs to be valued as curriculum. Mm -hmm. It needs to be able to sustain or to develop a STEM program mm -hmm. or vocational training programs, but we cannot let them not have it. Okay, but that one, is, uh, that one is, I want to, because we got about another 10 minutes, so, I want to make sure we spend some time yeah. on the gang thing. Yeah, I but just wanted to say something Real quick, that. right, because I want to make sure that we... Because the one thing I have to say about that is... It's real hard. Sam, Sam Thompson said this a few years ago when he was doing Restore the Village, and it still rings true. The dysfunctions of our children are the cries from the inadequacies of the adults. That's right, all of them. We don't, if parents don't value education themselves and are just sending their kids mm -hmm. to school, we'll never get it. Because if that parent was a, was an, was a menial student, 
who didn't value that well, education. Can, how, how can they not? Yeah. Even if they can't help you with the work, the, the desire and expectation. I think about when I was a little kid, my great aunt who raised me had a sixth grade education. My uncle had seventh grade education. Their number one value was education because it opens up opportunity. Mm. And it, when they Identifying said education... the problem is not saying that I'm pointing a finger. No, I'm not saying, saying that that's that the value to you. that we need to insert into our community, whether it's coming from the family, the school system, or anywhere else. But there was an extremely... Uh, large monetary mm -hmm. value that right. was missing mm -hmm. with a return on investment. Mm -hmm. If I'm spending $11.7 million on my black kids' education, mm -hmm. let's say all the black mm -hmm. kids, Somalis, and everybody else, mm -hmm. then guess what? Mm -hmm. We should have at least a 100% graduation rate, mm -hmm. or at least an 80%, or at least a 60%. Here's my question to that. We don't, and Here's it's been declining over the last 20 years, and that's a money problem to me. That's a, a money community doesn't health issue. change lack of that's interest. a community health issue. But she's issue. challenging that. I'm saying mm -hmm. that when we put money as taxpayers into yeah. an industry that is supposed to provide an opportunity um, and I and in my audit I work with parents they're pushed out of the opportunity to support their children there are so many groups within the school system that maintain an opportunity to provide the parental guidance that the parents are the push out the kids don't need to go to their parents for anything anymore the teacher is not even supposed to go to the parents mm. if there's a problem the parents find out after the fact, and even when they work to get in so they can say, look, I want to save my child's life. I don't want him being at bad at school and then coming home playing PlayStation because nobody's telling me there's an issue. My question you is, know? why do you, until your kid got A's and B's, why does he have a PlayStation? The children having A's and B's is not the problem. The A's and B's students, just like my cousin Clarence, who died in jail, mm -hmm. excellent student, always had A's, cried when he got a B. Mm -hmm. It's not that. It's but, they're not being challenged. There's not an opportunity to expand your educational opportunity. So, they, the children that have IEPs in our schools are being told to go and play basketball for 10 minutes after each class. Hmm. They get to leave early. They don't have any responsibility. You don't put the chairs back. You don't put your papers up. You get to leave early so that you can go play basketball and calm down and the rest of the class is going to be responsible. What is that telling you about when you leave and go into the mm -hmm. real world? Mm -hmm. Somebody going to take care of you. You got the black problem. That's how I feel about it. I'm militant when it comes to being accountable about my child's education within my community. And I hold everybody within that community that says it's an issue accountable to doing something mm -hmm. or wanting to try. And taxpayers. Because we will talk thing. about what mm -hmm. we can't do before yeah. we try to figure out what we can yeah. do. Yeah. And I know that I've been on the front line with my friend Tammy Tarver and her children and several other parents for several years. And I never see anybody but those parents sitting alone by themselves. Mm. When the ombudsman come and everybody else is standing against them sitting at that table, they're by themselves. They make me come in and they know the stuff. But it's a moral support situation that makes them feel confident enough to go in there and challenge these systems. And we have to start providing that. And we can get there if we start communicating. Okay. Now, now let's spend the rest of this time talking about another, another area, that a brand, if you will, mm -hmm. that tends to be a major issue with the majority of the community. That is gang members. The brand, is, in all due respect, has been People related like all to of us. Let's right. talk about that. How do we get there? How do we get out? When you say get out, what do you mean? What I mean, what I, what I mean by that is that, you know, the the I, the whole idea of listing, you know, uh, in fact, once they get on that list aspect of it, I guess uh, their whole me, lives are gone. For working, for doing street level gang outreach, for doing that kind of work for twenty years, here's the biggest thing. Most people, I, I, I tell, I, I tell people who are involved in those. Is, here's really what it is. Until you break the law, your association is not illegal. And until we teach our kids that, because here's the biggest thing what, that what happens with a lot of our young men, and this is how they're tricked. Mm -hmm. They're associate, they're conditioned to think there's something inherently wrong with their associations. Okay. And a lot of these associations start in middle school, elementary school, in your neighborhood. When we look at, when we look at what community was that created, when you look at, a, and say for example, if you take a neighborhood that was considered a gang neighborhood, there were certain things in there, a store, a church, a school, families, and people that they could connect with. Now, if you look at that, any cohort, whether it's a trade union, a fraternal order, a college sorority or fraternity, those are the same components. But they don't call them gang members. But, but again, what's happened is we have allowed one particular segment of society, okay. law enforcement, mm -hmm. to make this designation. Because if you look up the definition of gang, Police fit that, firemen, electrical workers, like I said, cohorts. What happens is we have allowed 
language to be deemed on us without asking what that means and then holding accountable. Like right now, one of the things my sister just did last week, she got taken off the gang list because she understood the language. Mm -hmm. And with a lot of our young people, they don't understand the language. They don't understand it. And what they are is cohorts. It's just like anything. When we were little, before, before the criminal element came to identify it, it was a kid from your neighborhood. It's still the kids from your neighborhood. What has happened is the kids from our neighborhoods have been conditioned to think to hang together and to be validated. Criminal activity has to be engaged and not necessarily organized because a lot of times when we got, we don't have organized criminal activity with young people. We have badass kids who are trying to find a way in a, in a society that has marginalized them like she said, that has doesn't have the structural integrity to provide them vehicles for a future. Mm -hmm. And they do what kids do. They congregate, they speak amongst each other, and they learn to protect each other. One of the things I always tell people, when we look at a lot of what the economic problems or, or black men who go to jail from drugs or the sale of drugs, and they look at it as a criminal and a price. Say, for example, you my best friend. If I just figured out your mom ain't got no money, mine ain't got no money. I done figured a way so I can feed myself, make sure my brother and sister got clothes, my mom is with. When I share that with you, I'm not sharing a criminal enterprise. I'm sharing the one self-sufficiency tool mm -hmm. I can share with you. Now if, I, now, if I knew, now, if I had a pathway to be an electrician at $35 an hour and I shared that, what would be the difference? It's behavior. And I think when we well, look at gangs, where we do. Cronyism. So, it's, <laughs> it so is I'm giving my violence. homie a sack versus <laughs> giving you a sack. But what it really speaks to is. How do we allow our kids to hear what self-determination is? Mm -hmm. And also when we look at gangs, are we asking what your criteria is? One of the things I've talked about for years is that we don't have gang violence. We have youth violence. Mm -hmm. Now, if we have gang violence, that's a law enforcement issue. If we have youth violence, that's a public health issue. And for so long, the driver has been fear. Mm -hmm. Fear drives public safety, and so public safety is deemed by law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Now, if public safety is driven by public health, education comes in. Economic opportunity comes in. Community trauma comes in. Mm -hmm. Personal trauma comes in. We have young men who are second and third generation members of families where the father has been killed mm -hmm. or a parent is in jail. So we don't even have killed children who suffer from PTSD in the tra traditional sense, because we traditionally say PTSD mm -hmm. man stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. What happens when the P is not post, but is persistent? Mm -hmm. So we have a continuation of trauma, and we know that trauma leads to maladaptive behavior, violence, uh, depression, acting out, high-risk behavior, substance abuse. So. As long as we keep it in a form where we can commoditize people by making them this morpheus thing, because a gang really is, does, has no humanity. Now, young black boys, black men, Latino men, white men, there's a humanity to that. And as long as we use language that strips humanity, we don't have a public health problem that requires healing. We have a, pro we have a public safety problem that requires suppression through fear. And for 20 years, that's what's been driving our well, black you know, men. You know, you got that knowledge, I'm sure, uh, through association. It's I, out there. Now, I so got the more friends that are gay members. No, but I'm just... No, but, what, and I only say that because... No, but, but you understand the problem. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, you, you know, it's like association. You know, we're all, we're all, we all, uh, if you will, individuals of, of exposure. Mm -hmm. You know, now, now my point is that how much time did they spend in terms of solutions to that, that issue? That's what I guess I'm I heard question. the same thing years back. Let me get question. my time, Roy. Okay, no, let's let me just add one thing. <laughs> I just want to add. We my, got about three, about two minutes. Just one minute. I just want to add my come public. Back. You got to come back. You the come public back health mental health hat. <laughs> this is what I put on my public health mental health hat. <laughs> Most people know what they need to heal themselves because they're the ones suffering the trauma. Too often, entities with a financial incentive okay. have to try to rectify this. We don't ask young people. We don't ask older ones that have gone. We don't invest in letting people who've been through the process be part of the solution yeah. without vetting them mm -hmm. through law enforcement. It's so if we have a public health issue that's community based, why do we vet it through law enforcement? Well, I've got two powerful people here. You know, I could, I could spend another hour well, on this whole issue. Well, I wanted to just issue. make a big one, point one about quick, that man, vetting through law enforcement and this whole gang thing. Go on. Oh, that the Department point. of Justice, like if the Department of Justice in the state of Oregon is basically investigating their own civil rights director 
and black Oregonians for using hashtags, you have to know that that system is already partnered up with all of our other systems. And I what are remember, you talking about for the benefit of the viewing? Well, order? I'm just saying like this past week, it was an announcement that was made that the Department of Justice has been illegally surveying and investigating people associated with the Black Lives Matter hashtag. And you know that we That's already Attorney have. Attorney General's office, right? Yeah. And, and my, you know, my organization, we already have legal representation uh, working directly with the Attorney General's office on that because, of course, you know, we're the ones out there protesting and nobody's getting investigated unless there's an uh, investigation ongoing, which is illegal based mm -hmm. on Oregon's constitutional law and their state mandate that enforces the federal law and even oversees it. But the thing is, is that a couple of years ago, I was in a meeting with the, you know, DCJC meeting with the Oregon Youth Authority, all these different entities, and they were saying the same thing that Royal is saying right now, except for it's a determined policy, policy opportunity. And this past legislative session and even before the legislative session here in the city of Portland, we advanced to the Joint Terrorism Task Force, which means we have three police officers that are FBI agents. They use the blueprinting method to identify at an early age who's going to be a gang member. They're pre-identifying them from age 8 to 11 uh, based on where they live, what church they go to, what mm. school they went to, who they're related to, uh, just their social environment. So that's not something brand new here. Mm -hmm. And it works even when we're not working with the okay. FBI. So we just have to be mindful of that. And again, it's the state-sanctioned discrimination. Okay. If we don't get political and start communicating, um, there's really no funds that can come from anybody to help us sustain or build that are going to be long-term okay. goals. Okay. Folks, you've had it, but the bottom line, you guys got to come back. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got we got to do this because, in all due respect, it's a, it's an issue. Mm -hmm. it, it's horrific, and and we got to we got to continue to communicate. And the folks out there who are going to be viewing this are, are really are thankful, if you will. I'm thankful for what you for the both of you and what you what you're doing, what you're trying to get there. We just got to get them involved in the process they got because to get policy involved. is again of the people, by the people, mm -hmm. and for the people. That's right. And they need to recognize that. Okay, yes, good. Sir. So again, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. I'll see you next week. Have a good one. Take care. Thank you, Bruce. Okay. Thank we, you for we, we can yeah. just keep talking. Yeah.